Somebody once said to me, give me one good reason why I should start macro photography. I'm going to go one better than that. I'm going to give you seven. Let's jump in. Welcome to another video. So today's video wasn't supposed to be about macro photography, although it included macro photography because I've bought, or I've only bought the kit for macro, photog uh, macro photography. Um, it was meant to be about mushrooms and lighting them. Um, now I've come out a bit early, I think. Um, we've had a really dry spell in the summer and that's been finished off with a probably week or more um, long spell of rain. Now I thought that was going to bring the mushrooms out and I was hoping to come out and get some and I've been to four different locations now and I've not found any mushrooms at all. Well, actually that's a lie, I found one mushroom which was, I believe it was, I think it's called a beefsteak mushroom. It's like a big, big mushroom that sits on the side of a tree. But it's not, not the mushroom I was looking for. Um, but other than that, I've not found anything wherever you have taken pictures of. So rather than waste the trip, what I thought I would do is turn it into a macro video as to why you should have a go at macro photography. So I've had a uh, little bit of a break, not a break from YouTube, but um, I've not uploaded as often as I should just because of the summer holidays. So hopefully now the kids are back at school, I should get back on track with my uploading schedule which is usually twice a week on a Wednesday and a Sunday but obviously life gets in the way of that and things change but generally I'm pretty consistent so yeah hope you've all had a good summer holiday or just a good summer if you haven't got kids So these are always quite common when you come out in the woods. Um, tree stumps that get covered in moss. You can always make an interesting background to a photo. Like so if you've got some mushrooms and that's behind it, it always makes a nice, nice image of the uh, greenery in the background. And I think we've got a spider on that twig there. So that'll make an interesting photo. Um, so I'm going to isolate the spider by using my flash. I use this flash all the time. I like to get the subject so they're free from any background uh, most of the time. If I'm doing mushrooms, then I'll take this flash off and I'll light the subject differently, uh, which I'll talk about in another video. Um, so yes, yeah, so the first reason I would say is Practice makes perfect, and this is something you're going to hear in every video you of tips of doing stuff, and it and it is very true that that practice does make perfect. Um, but the one reason it makes it different in macro photography is because you're going to get a lot more practice. So if I go out and take some landscape photos, I'm going to get say three or four photos when I go out. I go out for a, say a day, and I get three or four decent landscape photos. When I come out and do macro photography, I could come out for say an hour and I come back with a hundred, maybe more images, and a lot of them I will like. Uh, so a lot of them are repeats, so you'll take, what you'll do is you'll take, like say this spider, for example, I'll take it in a second. You'll get like say five or six of the same image, but it's still practice and it's good, it's good practice for not just um, macro photography, but just for your photography in general, compositions, lighting, and all the all the leading lines, rules of threads, it can all apply to macro photography. So that practice is going to be intensified because you're doing it so much more. So that would be my first my first uh, reason why you should get involved in macro photography. Let's uh, try and get a picture of this little spider down here. So I'm going to use the back of the camera just to see. So I can get a photo. 
not something I would normally do, but just because of where he is, or she, it's uh, a bit hard to get down on the floor because I haven't got no waterproofs on. I wasn't expecting to come out to get this sort of photo. I was gonna, I'm going to take the mushroom photos, and the mushroom photos, um, and I'll get to this in another video, but the mushroom photos, you're you can be tripoded but because I'm doing I'm getting this insect and they have a tendency of moving and with the uh, wind that you get a lot of movement in things so just the just a breeze can move the spider and that will throw the focus off so uh, generally I, mushroom photos I would have come out I would have used my tripod um, so I didn't bother putting any waterproofs on because I knew the ground was wet so I'm just getting as low as I can and using the back of the camera not that that's a bad way of doing it, it's just, I don't normally do it like that. I find it very hard to get the focus using the back of the camera because it jumps all over the place. I'm quite happy with that, that's quite nice. I'll pop that up on the screen. So the next reason I would give would be time. So we've not all got vast amounts of time to spend. So for a landscape photographer, for example, would need to go out, probably put aside half a day, maybe a day just to go out getting some landscape photos. Unless you live in an awesome location where you don't have to travel and it's on your doorstep, then that's different. Um, but macro photography, you don't really need the time. You've got everything you need in your own home. So there's so much to take photos of. You can just literally pick up your camera and not move and take macro photos and you'll be surprised on what you can see and what's around you that you haven't paid any attention to that looks amazing close up and I'm not talking like bugs and you know things like that I'm just talking about anything like the binders of a, a filofax or a um, or a, a pen the tip of a pen just in, in macro can look absolutely amazing and depending on what type of macro photography you like I, I would suggest, apart from living organisms, you know, I, I would suggest you've probably got most of it in your house or within a couple of minutes walk of your house. So giving macro photography a go doesn't really cost you a lot of time. So the next thing I would say is expect the unexpected, like a downpour of rain. Uh, okay. So you're chucking it down, but I was expecting it. Right, so the next thing I would say is expect the unexpected or expect the expected. And by that I mean when you go out and have a look around, when you're actually looking for something, you'll see stuff that you never even expected to see. Your brain kind of goes into this autopilot around you, and you don't see things that you kind of that are kind of around you on a daily basis. You only see stuff that you're really looking for. It's the um, cognitive bias, I think it's called. So when you when you buy a new car, you all of a sudden start seeing cars that are the same as yours. Um, and it's the same with macro photography. When you start thinking about what you can see in macro photography, you'll start seeing things that you wouldn't have expected to see before. Uh, an example of another example of seeing stuff you wouldn't expect to see is seeing stuff you can't see so this photo that I'll put up here on that little stem that comes off I didn't have a clue when I took the photo but taking that photo and then later on examining it I see that there's spiders on there and little micro bugs I don't know what they are like little lice type bugs there's all sorts of stuff on there and the things covered in cobwebs and you, you can't see that with the naked eye so getting into your macro, you know, really, really like getting your macro shots and examining them, you're going to see stuff you weren't expecting to see. And I think that's probably one of the cool things about macro is it's, it's, that, it's that not a normal viewpoint, isn't it? You, do, you don't expect to see bugs and 
So when you do see them on telly or when you do see them in photos, they look really interesting because it's new. So yeah, that's always, that was always a good thing. It's always the thing that's fascinated me, I think, with macro photography. Okay, so talking about expect the unexpected, um, just below me here, which I'll, as soon as it stops raining, um, I'll get a photo of it. I'll show you on the camera, um, is a skull. And I, I can't, I've looked up online to see what it is, but I can't identify it. So if you do know what it is, drop a, drop a message in the comments and let me know. Um, I'd love to know what it is. Um, so yeah, it's, it's skulls about the size of my hand. So it's not huge and it's just sat there and I've just had a little walk around and there's some more bones over here, just, just this way. You can't see, but pointing that way. Um, the skull's this way. Um, and I'm guessing it's the bottom jaw of the skull. And just a little bit further up as well is the, I assume it's the same skull, although this one looks very yellow and the bones are very white up there. So it could be a completely different thing, but there's no skull to the one that's the bones that are up there. So yeah, expect the unexpected. So as you can see, skull is just there. So I'm gonna grab an image of that. That's a bit morbid. Might, uh, might come in useful for Halloween. Um, so every time. next thing I would say next reason I would say is to get into macro photography is because you're not going to spend hundreds and hundreds or thousands of pounds on gear for macro photography assuming you've already got the camera you can pick yourself up a set of um, extension tubes which I picked mine up from I think it was eBay at the time and it cost me about six or seven pound for these just extension tubes they just increase the distance between your lens and your sensor um, which effectively turns, if you had a 50 mil prime, for example, it effectively turns it into a macro. Um, a macros, I think true macros are considered one to one ratio. So if you, your, if you imagine your camera's sensor, if your sensor was 36 millimeters, then if you took a photo of an insect, for example, of 36 millimeters, it would fill the sensor. Um, but you don't have to have a full frame sensor to take photos. You can do crop sensors. And if you've got a crop sensor, then that's even better because it will in, it will increase the size of the image because it's cropped. Um, the other thing you can get is reverse uh, reverse lens. I can't remember what they're called. Reverse lens rings. So they're little rings that um, you screw onto the uh, lens and then you can attach it to the camera body backwards. So the lens goes on upside down essentially, which effectively turns it into a macro lens. So that's another way. And there again, they're five or six quid. Um, you can buy more expensive ones and you can buy, you know, ones that do, if you've got the, um, for example, the extension tubes with the metal bits in it, they, it then allows your autofocus to work and it, it to talk to your camera. Um, but you can, you can buy any ones you want. It, it doesn't really matter just to get started. It's cost effective. It's, it's a really good way to get into photography, macro photography. Okay, so the next thing I would say is composition. If you struggle like I do with compositions, finding compositions in scenes and whatnot, then macro photography might be a good way to go to start you off. So your whole area that you're gonna compose, where you're composing your image to, A is a lot smaller, and B you can isolate images. So if you're taking a picture of a bug on a leaf, you pretty much got a bug on a leaf. You don't have to worry about what's in the background and all that sort of stuff. Although you can include the background, um, it's not an essential part of the picture. So you can eliminate a lot of stuff with macro photography. So that's one, one bonus point, I think. One good reason to start if you do struggle with uh, composition. So what I do is I've just moved the skull to this bit of greenery, um, the moss on top of the tree stump because I like the look of 
the um, the death and the, de uh, the dead leaves around it, uh, surrounded by the green moss. So you've got the living and the dead sort of juxtaposition in each other. So I quite like the, um, uh, the idea of that as an image. Uh, how it looks on camera, I don't know, but I think it could, could look quite good. Maybe not so macro, maybe a little bit further up than macro. Um, I'll give it a go both ways. Problem is I've only got the direct flash, so it doesn't look 100% because it's straight on, so the, um, the flash isn't the greatest. Having this flash on here. Yeah, it, does, it looks a bit rubbish. We'll give that a miss. So the rain's coming down a bit heavier now, so I'm gonna give you the rest of the uh, reasons under my umbrella. Um, so the next one, I can't remember what was on, three, maybe, four? Let's go four. Um, the next one would be lighting. So lighting, obviously, as, say, a landscape photographer, um, can be really important. Obviously, a portrait or any, any other types of photography, lighting is important. But with macro photography, it's not really a big deal. It's, it's, it's important, but it's not as important as waiting for the sun to come out. We can control the light. So today I've been using the ring flash on the front of the lens, which um, will light up any subject that's in front of the camera. You can get off-camera flashes. The flashes are very inexpensive as well. The ring flash I'm using, I think it's a KNF and it cost me about 60 pound. So it's not that, it's not that expensive. It's just the sort of same sort of price as a normal flash. But again, you can get off camera flashes that will do just as good and you can make your own light modifiers and you can, you know, you can use all the stuff you've got in your own home to get the light in right. You can, you can buy lights if you want to spend money on lights, but you know, most of us have got some sort of light that we can use to get started with. So lighting, um, we're not really dependent on and the next reason I, I think is to get into macro photography is, and I know I kind of covered this earlier, but you can literally take macro photos anywhere you go, any, any single place you can take macro photos of, and it will be completely different to what uh, you see. So when, for example, what I mean by that is if you went into the woods to take woodland photography, you're going to see whether you live in Scotland or whether you live in Cornwall, your woodland photography is going to look like woodland photography. Whereas macro photography, you can go anywhere and get a completely different image. You take a photo of a leaf up close or a fork um, up close. That's going to look completely different to what you'd normally see those objects. And if you imagine how many individual objects there are in the world and you can get close to every single one of those, your subjects is unlimited. You have no, you have no sunrise to wait for because you need to get a mountain shot and it looks good with a sunrise you can literally take a photo of anything you want, anything you see. So that's a really good reason. Um, and that's unli unlimited subjects. So the next reason I would say is yield. So your yield, and again, I said this earlier, but your yield for macro photography is going to be a lot, lot higher than it would be for going out and taking like, landscape photography or portrait photography. So you're going to take maybe two, 300 photos when you're out taking macro photography and of those two 300 photos you're going to get a good percentage of them are going to be the ones that you like so obviously that comes with practice uh, there's a little caveat there that you obviously just jumping into macro photography you may not get the focus right it may take you 20 photos to get the focus right there's a lot to there's a lot to the getting the focus right and the depth of field is quite shallow so there's a there's a couple of drawbacks to it but generally you once you get once you sort of get good at it you're going to find that you're going to end up with a lot of photos that you like and you're going to you're going to find that the more you go out and do it the more photos you're going to come back with that are good and then what will happen is you will take less photos but because you're good at it you won't you'll have say 100 photos instead of 300 but of those 100 60 may be good um whereas opposed to when you first start you may take 300 and only 50 or 60 may be good <clears throat> so that's me done for another video and the rain's still coming down so it's time to pack up and get home so let me know in the comments if you've been thinking about getting into macro photography and you haven't yet or you're going to because of this video please do let me know 
Um, if you haven't liked the video yet and you did find it useful, please do consider giving it a like. If you didn't like it, consider giving it a thumbs down. Um, if you haven't already subscribed and you like the content, please do consider subscribing. And I will catch you on the next one.